Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today, folks, we have a real treat for you all. We have Christopher Nozzle. He is the author of the best-selling Rosenfeld Media book, Make It So, Interaction Design Lessons from Science Fiction. He's going to be talking to you all today about how sci-fi and real-world interfaces influence each other. We're really excited to have Chris with us today to present this webcast for you all. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Chris for his presentation. Hello, Chris. Hello, hello. So thanks for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, my name is Chris. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting um, sort of a lot of material from Chapter 1 of the book that we've published, Make It So, Interaction Design Lessons from Science Fiction. And to do so, I don't have a PowerPoint because there's a lot of video involved. So forgive me just a moment while I um, do a screen sharing where you'll be able to see the custom presentation that I've made. So um, since we're on a webcast, um, uh, there is audio to the presentation, but I'm going to keep it fairly low so that I can talk over. Um, and in case anyone has some download speed issues, I'll also be describing what's happening in the video clips as we go over them. So hopefully you can see my screen now. And what you should see is uh, a giant starry sky with the title of the book in the dead center and a few spaceships flying by. Um, but we're going to go ahead and move forward. So as you, Yasmin introduced, my name is Christopher Nossel. Um, in my day job, I work as a managing director of interaction design at a company called Cooper in uh, downtown San Francisco, um, where we do interaction design for um, lots of companies in the healthcare space and the startup space. Um, but today, of course, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the book that I co-authored with Nathan Shedra. Um, he is chair of the sustainable business degree at um, of the California College of the Arts here in San Francisco. And together, we have written a book called Make It So. Um, if you're curious about more of it, we are keeping a blog at scififinterfaces.com, where you can actually see um, many other reviews of movies um, and posts that aren't from the book. Um, Sci-fi is a never-ending stream of media, and we're keeping up with it um, through the web. If you're interested in getting updates about those uh, posts on the blog, um, you can always follow us on Twitter at Make It So Tweets, um, where we keep an eye on the Make It So hashtag as in addition to the sci-fi tag that we'll be tracking today. So to write this book, um, we, have, we took about six years um, to get from uh, the initial conversation between Nathan and myself and the actual publication. What we did is we took a very thorough sort of look at science fiction. Um, we gathered together almost every sci-fi title that we could think of, um, and we um, began to build an online database of the interfaces that we saw in those properties. We then tagged them and then began to use the tag in order to tag, in order to understand what it was we were looking at and begin to write about them. So in the book, you'll see some things about um, various UI components, and you'll also see some things about sort of uh, tasks that people do or sort of domains of knowledge like medicine or learning or even the, um, the very last, the second to last chapter is on sex-related interfaces in sci-fi. And there's actually more than you might imagine. Um, this uh, material that I'm going to be speaking about today is specifically the stuff from Chapter 1, um, which is all about sort of how it is that we can use science fiction as interaction designers. And the bulk of the talk is really about the lines of influence. Um, how it is that we influence sci-fi makers as designers, and in turn, how those designers um, of sci-fi end up influencing us. So those are some pretty big terms, design and science fiction, um, and I probably ought to be careful about what exactly it is that we mean. Um, we cover all sorts of design over the course of the book. I'm an interaction designer, um, so of course it's easy to take a look at the interaction design elements. Um, the uh, industrial design we sometimes touch on as we're talking, as we're looking at the interfaces in sci-fi. And of course, things that appear on screen means that we're often taking a look at the information design as well. Um, but the, the, the actual thing that we are seeing on screen is the interface. And so uh, it's fair enough to say that that's the thing that you can focus on over the course of the book is interface design. So when we say that, that's what we mean. Similarly, sci-fi is a gigantic genre, and uh, we had to be very specific about what we meant. In order to take a look at the interfaces, the first thing that we had to do is the, the sci-fi we considered for the book had to be visual. That means that all of our favorite books weren't in the survey that we built. 
Uh, the second thing that it had to be moving, and so there's plenty of sci-fi um, illustrations and photographs um, and even um, uh, graphic novels, but we couldn't consider them, partially because we need to see a user moving in order to evaluate how awesome or terrible the interface is. Um, and the final sort of uh, constraint that we gave ourselves is that it had to be consistent from depiction to depiction. Um, and so that means that all of our favorite hand-drawn sci-fi is sort of out of the survey. Um, 3D animation um, is in just because it takes like more effort to change those interfaces between screenshots uh, than it would for hand-drawn, since that's constantly being redrawn. What that leaves us with in sci-fi is really screen sci-fi, um, the stuff like television and movies um, where we can actually see interfaces that are consistent from depiction to depiction being used across time. That gives us sort of enough of, a, of an experience in order to evaluate it. So with those things in mind, that we're talking mostly about interface design and interaction design lessons and sci-fi that appears on either the small screen or the big silver screen, uh, we can then begin to sort of talk about these lines of influence um, and how it is that um, we can use sci-fi to be better designers. To do that, what we took a look at is sort of these lines of influence. And there is, of course, a small ring of influence between the two, which is individual inspiration. Um, you know, design doesn't happen in a, you know, like the weather. Uh, there are people who are doing design. And similarly, sci-fi doesn't just happen. There are lots of people involved in the creation of any one sci-fi property. And those people can be inspired directly by the things that they see in the world around them. I'll show you some examples of that in just a minute. Looking outside of the sort of individual stories, there are also sort of big arcs and patterns of what we see in the world. The way that design mostly influences sci-fi is by establishing the actual paradigms in the world that science fiction extends. That's sort of a mouthful, so I'll repeat it. Designers, as they design, are putting things in the world that, that put a paradigm into place. Um, and the people who make sci-fi are using those things and observing those things have to extend that paradigm when they build sci-fi. And I'll show you some examples to illustrate that. And then there are three ways that sci-fi in turn influences uh, design. The first way is by influencing the expectation of our audience, of our users. Um, people who use our software and our um, services go to movies and to watch television, and they often have their expectations set by the things they see there. They can also remind us of the social context, um, that uh, even though technology is evolving incredibly fast, um, humans aren't evolving that much, and there are certain constraints that we have to pay attention to, um, as, and sci-fi will often remind us of those. So the last big area of influence is actually of proposing new paradigms, like, hey, here is a way that this could work, and then it's up to designers to sort of detangle that mess as we try and take those paradigms back into the real world. So that's sort of the structure for our talk today. Um, I'm now going to zoom in um, and talk to you about the individual arcs. For this upper arc, um, remember I was talking about how designers, we influence sci-fi by establishing paradigms. What we did is we actually took a look at all of the science fiction um, interfaces across time and compared those um, to the events of technology across time, and we learned some interesting things. Um, one thing that was really super nifty is that um, one of the very first pieces of film happened to be a science fiction uh, movie. So if you're not familiar, Georges Méliès was um, the subject of a movie in the summer of last year, um, uh, partially because he was one of the earliest filmmakers who took a camera to his vaudeville set uh, and filmed his actors doing things um, that were pretty forward-looking. Um, in this film, Le Voyage dans la Lune, uh, in 1902, um, a number of astronauts head to the moon. What's really charming about this clip, and I'll play it and talk over it, um, is that there aren't anything that we would recognize really as interfaces. So if you want to get a bunch of scientists to the moon, how do you do that? You put them in a giant bullet, um, and there's no interface to close the doors or seal them up. You literally just grab the door and push it closed. Um, even to launch that rocket to the moon, you don't have a complicated interface to do it. You shoot them out of a giant gun that's lit with a long matchstick. It's kind of no surprise that, um, uh, that 
a piece of science fiction at the very turn of the century um, wouldn't have interfaces because the audience was operating, and the filmmakers, of course, as well, were operating in an industrial age paradigm. Um, they couldn't imagine what electronic circuits were because they didn't really have them in the world to think about. And certainly um, their audiences wouldn't have understood them even if they did want to include some more complicated concepts. Um, so it's an interesting sort of side note um, that one of the first pieces of film happens to be science fiction and that it tells us something about the way that science fiction builds on existing paradigms. Georges Méliès could not build on any other paradigm than the one that we're seeing here. Let's compare that with the sort of first serious piece of science fiction, um, which is um, Metropolis by Fritz Lang. Um, it came out in 1927. Uh, during this clip, what we're going to see is Joe Frederson, the fellow, super pixelated fellow on the left that you can see there. He's coming up into his elite office in the upper city of the metropolis in order to essentially check his uh, messages and then call a fellow by the name of Grot in the lower city. And what's really fascinating about this particular clip is the sort of mis mix and match of technology that Fritz Lang used to uh, depict this to check his messages, he picks up sort of ticker tape. Then he turns on and sort of has to tune in the video channel. Right? You can see there that he's kind of in between those channels. Once he has the channel right, he picks up what is essentially a telephone at the time and then flicks a switch. Um, that switch in turn flicks lights down on Grot's interface, and Grot understands and runs up to it, picks up his end of the phone, and they have a conversation. There are some other interesting things about this particular interface, such as you know, the way that he uh, turns off the interface, is that he hangs up, the fact that you can't really see a camera mechanism. Um, but for our purposes, what's really interesting about it is that Fritz Lang was using the technological paradigms of his day, and it ended up being quite a bit of a mess. I don't think we would use that sort of complicated convolution of technologies today uh, to show something what we consider as simple as video telephony. Let's compare and contrast that. Um, to the same interface in a movie that was released in 1939. This was Buck Rogers, one of the serials that appeared before longer films. Um, in this brief clip, uh, we're going to see uh, another video phone. But I want you to pay attention as we watch it to the ways that this um, interface is controlled. It's one of Killer Kane's spaceships. Possible. I know that type of ship too well to be mistaken. So you see there, he simply turns the knob to change the channel. And then turns another knob in order to turn the volume or turn the device off. And charmingly, they have to go into another room to uh, hear audio and talk to the people in that spaceship that they just viewed. So we take a look at these two clips, one from 19. Um, 27 and one from 19, uh, I've already forgotten the date, 19, in the 1930s um, in Buck Rogers, it's the same interface, but there's a significantly different uh, advance in the simplicity of the controls of the interface. So what happened in between? If this were a live session, I would uh, hopefully hear the word television out from somebody, because that's exactly what happened. Fritz Lang had to cobble together technologies um, for Metropolis to convince an audience that this thing that they were seeing was viable, real. Um, and over the course of uh, 15 years, um, Buck Rogers could simply say, hey, you know that thing that you already use, television? It's like that, only bigger. So the dial could be sort of more discreet, and audiences would go, yeah, I know what that is. So in each case, the filmmaker is extending the paradigm just a little bit um, and had the paradigm been different, had we used sliders instead of knobs for television, um, you would see Buck Rogers using sliders instead of knobs. Unless anyone in the uh, listening um, thinks that this is a, um, uh, an artifact of black and white era, uh, hopefully you'll remember this clip from Jurassic Park in 1993. Uh, during this, Lex rushes to the computer and uses a Unix system in order to try and lock all the doors um, in the complex to protect them from the oncoming velociraptors. What's sort of charming is that, yes, this was sort of a weird module for Unix. Um, uh, so a lot of people think it was pure fiction, but no, in fact, it was a real module. Um, but what's awesome is that Steven Spielberg 
um, the director wanted to take pains to show the audience how it was that Lex was doing this because it was so strange. So in this scene, they close up on her face, show what's happening on screen, and then the camera will um, pan down in order to show you that what she's actually doing is moving a mouse. And so that one second clip reminds us that you know, like we're still just extending paradigms. Audiences in 1993 certainly didn't have the internet, didn't have a lot of computer experience, um, but they certainly sort of knew what a mouse was and so could make the connection here and say, oh, I see, she's using a mouse to navigate this weird 3D space. So hopefully that has gone a ways to convince you about that notion that as designers, the things we build influence the people that um, who make sci-fi, um, and they sort of take those into their own work. And even though that sort of first arc is like a, a big overarching concept, um, there are a few numbers of individual stories that I can share as well. If you don't, if you're not familiar with the Visible Human Project, it's a little more of it, but really fascinating. It started in 1989, and it's still going on. Um, and in the project, um, the um, uh, makers of the project sort of asked for a, a volunteer to donate their body after they had died. Um, one prisoner, um, uh, in an, I think it was an American prison, um, had donated his body, and upon his death, they um, froze him in a solid block of ice and shaved that block a millimeter, I think, at a time, um, and scanned every section. And then uh, took the, the makers took all of those scans and put them back together in an online database so that you can sort of move through the human body in a way that had never been done before. So here you can see the blue ice um, sort of in the lungs and in the pipes. Um, and it's actually sort of a, a beautiful thing. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend after our talk today that you go check it out. Um, but I wasn't the only one who was sort of inspired by seeing this. Um, somebody at Fox Studios was also similarly inspired, as we see in this clip, from the second X-Men movie, X2, in 2003. In this clip, Magneto, <clears throat> Excuse me. Magneto is um, in prison, in a plastic prison, and there is a guard coming in to speak with him, and he is being scanned for any magnetic objects or metallic objects that uh, he may have on him. The interface that the security guard uses to do this has a little section in the upper right-hand corner that boink, shows exactly sort of uh, something that should look wildly familiar after what I just showed you. Um, it is, a, it is an example of sort of um, a sci-fi maker using things that are out there in the world in order to influence themselves. They thought, hey, this thing was cool. Um, I'm going to contact them and see if I can use it for my own purposes. And it's not just sort of a science that sci-fi will turn to. Um, they'll often turn to art as well if you happen to be in, on the art side of interaction design. In this case, Damien Hurst, Damien Hurst is sort of a, a notorious British artist um, who is famous for, among many things, um, slicing up cattle and putting them in uh, blocks of formaldehyde for museum visitors to come and sort of marvel at the insides of this animal. Um, well, that was a direct inspiration for this scene from The Cell in the year 2000. Uh, this isn't a scene that's in the movie that happens in reality. It happens in the mind of a serial killer. But as you can sort of see, it's directly inspired by the Damien Hurst piece. Glasses come down, horse is separated, and our lead protagonist sort of walks up fascinatedly to the, uh, the inside of the horse. Sort of interesting is that in this clip, the sci-fi makers went one better. Um, and where Damien Hurst certainly had a dead animal, um, the sci-fi makers could sort of keep that horse kind of alive. And there you can see its heart still beating and its wound still working. So that's like uh, just two little stories in order to show you how individuals in sci-fi can be influenced by the things out in the world, and not just sort of responding to you know, the mass of paradigms, but to the very particular details that we put into um, our work. So that arc was all about sort of how design influences sci-fi. Down below, we're talking about the way that sci-fi influences design. And that first way, again, is with individual inspiration. One of my sort of favorite stories um, or, or that we discovered over writing the book was this one, um, in which a fellow who worked for um, the uh, U.S. military uh, was successfully petitioned by his teenage son to go watch a movie about superheroes. Um, the fellow's name was Douglas Caldwell, and uh, Douglas really didn't have an interest in superheroes, but he did want to spend time with his son, so we went to the movie. And to his utter surprise, during the course of the movie, he saw a solution to a 2,000-year-old problem that he faced daily at work. 
So in this clip, we see the X-Men standing around and they're um, playing the Blackbird, looking at a sort of uh, computerized pin board where they're talking about the plans that Magneto has for the city. And the reason that this particular pin board was of interest to Douglas is that he worked for the U.S. Topographical Army of Engineers. Um, one of their primary jobs was to outfit generals in the field with maps of the potential theaters of war. They did this in 3D. Generals think better in 3D, and the outcomes are often better. Um, and so when he saw this on screen, he was like, what he saw was a, a platform where you could represent any geography at any time at any scale. So he went and got the DVD for this movie as soon as it came out, and he wrote a request for a proposal, sent it out to a number of companies that directly referenced this scene in the film, and within about four years, he had a working prototype called the Xenovision. Here is the Xenovision closed, and in the next one, we can see it open. What you see there on the base is actually a computer-controlled array of pins. What's interesting is that the Xenovision did X-Men 1 better. That cover comes down, um, and I think it's a latex cover that um, seals down. It's vacuum sealed onto those pins, and then they can project things onto its surface. So here we'll see it start off sort of flat, then the vacuum kicks in. Oops, sorry, the vacuum kicks in, and you can sort of see the 3D shapes take form. Really fascinating because that device would not have existed without the X-Men, um, which we found out from the art director of the movie uh, that Brian Singer uh, had actually gotten the idea from actually just one of those mall stores, one of those devices that you can stick your hand in um, and see an impression of it. So it sort of comes full circle, right? Um, some designer made that or uh, yeah, some designer sort of made that um, pin board which influenced sci-fi, which in turn influenced the real world. So if that's like a story of individual inspiration, remember there are three arcs where sci-fi ends up influencing us as designers. The first way is by setting audience expectations, and it can do that in one of two sort of salient ways. The first is in terms of function. Um, the clip that we're about to see is from The Day the Earth Stood Still. Um, and it's not the first depiction of robots, but it's one of the earliest depiction of robots um, in film. Um, and it was sort of a super menacing one. The funny thing was that of course, this robot uh, is a servant of humanity and looks sort of very humanoid. Actually, his name is Gort, and he opens up his uh, eye visor and he ends up sort of wrecking havoc on the U.S. military. Um, and that trend of sort of representing robots as humanoid continues to fairly recently. Um, in this clip from 2004 of iRobot, we see Will Smith goes to the door, um, only to see sort of a delivery bot there from FedEx. Again, sort of superhuman um, and not superhuman, very human-like, um, and certainly quite subservient to humans. That form sort of persists into the real world. Um, it's sort of the, our expectations of what robots are going to do for us. So even though industrial robots sort of tend to be very inhuman, if you've ever seen a robot that sort of builds a car, uh, you'll know what I mean. Uh, they don't look human at all. But when it comes to giving humans robots for interaction, um, those end up taking a very humanoid uh, look indeed. Case in point, this is Asimo, the robot that Honda has been pouring billions of yen into developing. Um, and we've got this robot, um, billions of dollars in investment, and we have it not only humanoid, but we're having it sort of bringing us coffee. So this notion that audience expectations are sort of um, seeded ahead of time, right? This robot didn't exist to bring us coffee in its form um, just out of the minds of Honda, but also because the audience has sort of been uh, primed to expect that. Um, expectations aren't just for form, but also for function. Um, and uh, hopefully there might be somebody old enough uh, listening who can remember the original Star Trek from 1966. Uh, those communicators were sort of a brand new idea, kind of part walkie-talkie and um, part telephone, um, and they worked across big differences. But it wasn't the function that was sort of super cool. It was the form factor. Um, you can see there that Kirk has a, a phone open that sort of flips open like a clamshell. Um, and this is actually a funny clip because they're trying to debug the phones. Um, and uh, that... Or, or that device in science in Star Trek uh, was so influential that when Motorola decided to um, place a big bet um, on its first clamshell 
um, phone that was released 30 years later. Uh, they even called it the Star Tech, sort of a very thinly veiled reference to the Star Trek inspiration um, that drove this form factor, even though cell phones had been out for quite some time. So that second sort of big arc uh, is reminding us about the social context. And as I said before, technology is evolving fairly quickly, but humans aren't. And they provide a set of constraints that science fiction that technology bumps into. And certainly sci-fi likes to remind us of that in a number of different ways. Um, one of those constraints that we sort of work with, and this section dives sort of down into it, is the notion that those that the robots remind us of. Um, people are good at people. And therefore, anthropomorphism, you know, taking a humanoid shape, um, has consequences because that's where we're hardwired for those consequences and, and dealing with other people. Anthropomorphism, for instance, triggers our sense that, oh, if you look human, you can do human-like things. Um, this sort of plays out in a number of different ways. Um, the sort of infamous Clippy um, example from Microsoft or even the, the, the Bob example from Mac, lest we just... Um, uh, this too much on Microsoft, all sort of try and take that anthropomorphism and also also frustrate us uh, similarly um, mm -hmm. in that each of them kind of look, they use language, they have eyes, they have, uh, in the case of Bob, uh, you know, it's a dog, um, and uh, we expect them to behave human and sort of get frustrated when they don't. And in fact, they can even trigger our sense of social offense. Um, the very sort of short-lived Mrs. Dewey, which was a Microsoft search engine with sort of this avatar in front of it who would sort of respond in very catty and sassy ways to your search request, um, well, sort of offended a lot of people. And it wasn't because it was a piece of technology. It was because she was human and she was triggering that sense within us. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to be bypassing a few of these examples. Um, but certainly there are other things, like just the, 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 the human use of language is enough. Um, folks familiar with Star Trek The Next Generation or even the original know that the ship talks. Um, and the nice thing about it is it doesn't talk exactly like a human. It doesn't have intonation. It doesn't have pacing. It kind of sounds a little off. That helps set the, the notion in the audience's mind that this is a limited thing. It's not human, and so you can't really have a conversation with it. It's not going to be a replacement uh, for a person where you can, you know, stop being lonely by talking to the ship's computer. It can do a limited number of things um, through a voice interface, but that's it. Compare that to um, Star Wars, where one of the sort of most beloved characters, R2-D2, um, doesn't even use language, and yet we sort of uh, have the sense that he has emotions um, when he first uh, is driving through the uh, Tatooine desert, having separated from C-3PO, and the Jawas begin to eyeball him. Um, he has this sort of sad little beep uh, Fair enough. Where well, through those simple sort of sounds, you can you understand that he's a little bit worried, um, and gives us this sense that no, he he doesn't have language like uh, you know C3PO or humans, but he he certainly has a great deal of human-like emotions um, and an internal state that we 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 care about. Similarly, Knight Rider. Um, uh, is the AI that um, was part of this car, Kit, um, was fully human. And unlike the Star Trek ship's computer, you could have conversations with it. According to my projections, the source should be here within seconds, Michael. And part of what's driving that is the fact that, yes, it talks very much like a human. In fact, it talked like Michael Carradine because that was the voice actor underneath it. But not just sound is enough for that effect. Behavior is enough for that effect. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the one click in Amazon when it was sort of patented um, was sort of behaving like your favorite bartender, like, hey, you know what? I can make this super easy for you. Um, and it makes us sort of uh, relate to Amazon's brand um, from our social side of things. So the final point I'll make on this um, anthropomorphism bit is that uh, we know that likeliness, uh, likeness increases the effect. Um, in the uh, Vin Vendors film, Until the End of the World, in 1991, there was a search engine. Um, and this search engine was Bounty Bear. And once you made a request, Bounty Bear would sort of keep looking for it. There he is, walking around. And he actually says, I'm searching, I'm searching, I'm searching. And when he finally finds what they're looking for, um, he's able to show it to them. The fact that he's not human lets you know that, you know what, he's not a full human agent. Uh, we wouldn't expect that of him. 
unlike characters in the Matrix. Um, you know, this is not a reality that we're seeing. I presume you're familiar with one of the most popular sci-fi films of all time. Um, but these are computer-generated avatars um, where they look human and we have full human expectations of them. Most notably, the Oracle is a computer algorithm that uses heuristics and, um, you know, uh, kind of forget the name of the technology. Uh, hidden Markov models, I think they're called, can sort of do future predictions. Um, but this one isn't just an algorithm. It looks like a person. Um, and so, you know, Neo has emotions towards this, what is essentially an algorithm. So all those things help to remind us that, you know, we are humans, uh, our users are humans, and whatever holds true for mm -hmm. those humans is going to hold true for our uh, future technologies. The last sort of arc of influence that I want to talk about is the proposed paradigms. Um, Sci-fi actually does have some notions that it says, hey, wouldn't this be cool if things worked this way? Um, and this is probably the thing that is sort of most pertinent to our book because these are the things that we really like to study the most, um, partially because they're like new ideas for us, but they're not all new. Some of the paradigms that are proposed by science fiction are things that we all know, but it's really nice to have a reference uh, in, a, in a common source like science fiction. Take, for instance, the interaction design rule that the constraints of a system help us learn it easier. Um, that should be something that interaction designers are very familiar with um, very on an, early on in their education or um, across their careers, where they go, ah, if we help the user avoid mistakes, they'll just make fewer of them. Well, there are certain examples of that in science fiction. In this clip from the fifth element from 1987, um, the group of four are in this pyramid trying to start an, a weapon that hasn't been fired for 2,000 years. Corbin Dallas just take advantage of is constraints, right? That um, triangular block can only go in that triangular hole in one particular way. Well, actually, two particular ways, but it doesn't matter, right? That constraint is what helps him go, oh, I can uh, take the infinite possibilities that one might have for firing an ancient weapon and figure out how it goes. This is sort of a positive example, but we also have negative examples that we can talk about in sci-fi. In this animated short from Pixar called Lifted, we meet a young alien who is learning the ropes of abduction from an older alien. The joke here is actually a user interface joke, right? Um, there are no constraints on this interface, and that poor little alien has to go about trying to figure out how to abduct a human with, uh, you know, what must be on the order of thousands of different switches arrayed for him without any labeling or clustering or uh, affordances or mapping, and the poor guy just can't figure it out. He, even here, he's trying to use uh, social cues uh, in order to figure it out and uh, ultimately fails. So we have positive and negative examples in sci-fi of these things that interaction designers know. Hey, you know what? This is a paradigm, and uh, we can refer to it um, in our conversations with each other and with our clients and with stakeholders or even with uh, students who are trying to learn this stuff. There are also some paradigms that um, may be known in the world but not known commonly. Um, the um, effective interface group at MIT um, has been working on computer systems that are familiar with and respond to its users' emotions um, for a number of years. Um, and yet we don't actually have this out in the marketplace fairly commonly now. Um, but nonetheless, like we have examples in sci-fi of this very thing that is known in the lab, that um, the input should know the effective states, the emotions of their users. 
start with a negative example back to the fifth element, partially because it's one of my favorite pieces of science fiction. Uh, but in this scene, Emmanuel Zorg um, is choking on a cherry pit um, and hopes to summon security using an interface on his desk. So certainly Zorg didn't want his shirts to go popping up out of his desk um, or to summon the, you know, uh, inarticulate, weird, mutant elephant pet. Um, what he was doing was panicking. Um, and if we were to redesign this interface today with this in mind, we would say, hey, um, if you're seeing discrete presses on individual buttons, consider that input. If you see a bunch of buttons being mashed really hard, consider that a panic and do something different. Well, that's something that we can see in sci-fi, and as designers go, hey, I think I can use that. And not only do we see sort of negative examples, but we can see positive examples as well. Here we actually have a scene from Stanley Kubrick's sci-fi masterpiece, 2001 A Space Odyssey, um, which was released in 1968. In the scene, Dr. Floyd is on a satellite orbiting the moon, which you can see in the background, um, and having a video conversation with his little girl back on Earth. What I'd like you to pay attention to, pardon me, what I'd like you to pay attention to is the little girl's hands during the course of the call. Well, you know, Daddy's traveling. I'm sorry about it, but I just can't. I can send you a very nice present, though. Yeah. Anything special that you want? Yeah. What? So right there, right during the middle of the call, she begins to mash on the buttons. And what we don't hear is the call being interrupted. We don't hear touch tones. We don't hear any clicking. Um, in fact, the film just sort of ignores it. Now, we actually know what was happening. This was Stanley Kubrick's daughter. She was probably there late on the set, and there was pressure to get her home in time for dinner and get her to bed. Um, so they just sort of left it. They were like, oh, we're not going to worry about it. But on the other hand, if you were a smart interface designer, you would look at this and say, oh, that's exactly how it should happen. The interface should know I'm not dealing with an adult. I'm dealing with a three-year-old kid, and it wouldn't make any sense to be pressing buttons in the middle of this call because they would have no consequences and to ignore that input. So as designers, we can watch for these moments um, where things appear to be broken, but actually, because they work for the audience, would work for our users as well and incorporate them into our backpack of useful techniques. And the very last sort of way that we take a look and use new paradigms uh, is by taking a look at those technology bits that uh, aren't already known or aren't already known in the lab, but that are genuinely new to science fiction. Take, for instance, Holography. Um, uh, you'll see that in quotes partially because I'm, I'm a bit of a, uh, of a word nerd and I like to pay attention to um, you use very correct words for things. turns out that uh, holography is a, a term that really should only apply to sort of 2, 2D, that sort of silver printing that you see sometimes on credit cards. Um, and really when the, the things that we see in things like Star Wars are, are, should be called volumetric projections. Um, but there's an interesting example in Star Wars um, when they were using volumetric projection in order to communicate um, differently between the Empire, a very hierarchical organization, and the Jedi, which are very much more egalitarian. So in this clip from Star Wars 6, The Empire Strikes Back, um, you can see that when Darth Vader sort of begins to speak to the Emperor, bows down, the uh, technology comes on, the Emperor's face appears as a giant floating, terrifying, hooded figure um, that sort of dwarfs um, Darth uh, Vader by comparison um, and sort of enforces that notion of a social hierarchy. Let's contrast that with the um, very egalitarian volumetric projection of the Jedi. Here we're actually going to Star Wars III, The Revenge of the Sith. Um, from the standpoint of the Wookiees, um, they're seeing sort of all of those Jedi 
being presented equally because they have a sort of a small projection surface. But when we get to the Jedi chamber, we can actually see that Yoda is being presented as sort of equal in size to all others. This notion sort of reinforces, oh, hey, if we're going to have scaled presentations of our users, let's make sure that that scaling has meaning. Here in, in Star Wars, it's actually used to reinforce the notions of social hierarchy. Um, but in our own technologies, we could use the same thing. If you were going to be making, for instance, a video teleconferencing um, with, that showed avatars or live video feeds of the people talking, you might want the speaker to sort of be bigger to draw the user's attention to it. Or if you had an earnings announcement from a company, you certainly would want the person speaking and giving that announcement um, to sort of have the most visual hierarchy and those who are listening or the analysts online to be a little bit smaller. And this is an idea that we can pull from um, the ways that science fiction makers use their tools, their fictional tools, because we really don't have you know, fully fleshed floating volumetric projections in the world for interaction designers to play with. Another example is the problem that we've sort of seen in sci-fi and we're just getting into figuring out as interaction designers now, which is how do I, if I have a computer system that watches me all the time, distinguish between when I want it to pay attention to me and when I really don't want it to pay attention to me. So um, in gestural interfaces, especially those that are sort of operating by a camera, um, you need to be able to tell it, hey, this is when I'm scratching my nose and this is when I want you to delete a file. That actually came up in Minority Report way back in 2002 before we had a lot of experience with gestural interfaces in reality. Um, uh, I'm not going to show that clip in the interest of time, but certainly this one. Um, in this scene, we see John Anderton, who has sort of that glove interface to gesturally control videos. Um, he is actually approached by a fellow um, to whom he's introduced. Um, Anderton turns to shake his hand and by accident almost erases all of his work uh, and uses sort of the gestural controls and apologizes and said, I can't, can't really shake your hand right now. And that's something that we're actually finding in uh, interfaces like the Kinect, uh, Microsoft's Kinect, Xbox's Kinect. Um, like it, you, you have, we're going to have to find a way for computers that are actually watching and paying attention to us all the time to know when we're talking to them and when we're not. So the title of our talk is about how this can make, how science fiction can make you a better designer. Um, and that sort of touches on sort of my mission with the book, um, which is that most of us sort of enjoy sci-fi. It's safe to say since it's the second most popular genre after action, according to, I think it's Rotten Tomatoes is where we got that statistic. Um, but my mission sort of in getting designers to pay closer attention to sci-fi is that I want you to use science fiction and not just simply be a recipient of the paradigms and the tropes and the interfaces that they put out there for us to get used to, but to, to actually give a critical mind to them and say, is this something that we want to do? Um, is, are the interfaces that we build in the real world, um, should they operate like that? What are the constraints of science fiction or should they operate a little bit differently for the real world? And if so, how? And I believe that in so doing, paying attention to those um, proposed paradigms that science fiction puts in front of us, um, that we can actually not only improve our work as designers, but allow us to think about the future before it gets here and before we're having to react to it. We can be a lot more proactive and hopefully uh, know how to handle these technologies when they actually come into our lives, um, or even more so when they come under our hands as designers. And hopefully along the way we can make a better world. Um, so that's uh, the bulk of sort of the talk today. Um, <clears throat> there's my name again if you need to ask a question. Um, uh, and the uh, blog URL there, scifiinterfaces.com, if you're curious about it. Um, and, of course, our Twitter handle if you want to follow it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude our webcast today. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.